All right, and we are live once again. Good morning, everybody. Today is Thursday, July 16th, 2020, and welcome back to our Facebook page. My name is Michael Quidall, Digital Marketing Specialist for the New Jersey School Boards Association. Once again, coming at you live through the power of Cisco WebEx, trying our best to flatten the curve and always practice safe social distancing. NGSBA has been hosting Facebook Live events to address questions from boards, school administrators, and educators throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And New Jersey School Boards Association is here and will be here to support boards of education and their districts on the road back. If you want a replay of any of our previous broadcasts or live streams, click the videos tab on the left-hand side of the NGSBA Facebook page. An incredible list of, of content there, live streams, broadcasts, other video content, um, interviews. So definitely check that out and make sure you click the like button so you can be notified when we do go live in the future. Quick note about Workshop 2020. NGSBA is excited to announce that we are bringing the heart of Workshop, the training, collaboration, resources, and networking to a virtual conference to take place on October 20th through the 22nd. And we are inviting you to submit a session for the event. All program submissions will receive equal consideration. Those submitting proposals will be notified of the association's decision via email mid-August to late August. And I'll put the Google Doc in the comment section below. So we encourage you to submit a session for that today. Um, Without further ado, today we are joined by Chris Avilas, teacher and head coach of Knollwood Middle School, a Fairhaven school district, Glenn Robbins, superintendent, Bringing Teen School District, and Lawrence Coco, senior program consultant, Sustainable Jersey Digital Schools, for a discussion on the importance of esports in education. We will also discuss the value of scholastic esports and why every school should have an esports team and really how it can make the road back to school easier on students. Um, lastly, before we bring on bring in the guests, I want to let everyone know that we will be monitoring the comment section during and after the broadcast. So if you have a question or a comment or just want to say hi and where you're from, drop it in the comment section below and I'll forward it along to our experts. So whether you are a school board member, administrator, teacher, or even a parent, we are here to serve you and help you work through this difficult time. And finally, um, as always, I said on every single live broadcast, all the live streams, and it's the most important. I hope everyone and their families are healthy and are doing are, and are doing okay at, during this difficult time. So without further ado, I want to start kind of bringing the guests into the live stream here. Um, good morning, Chris. We're going to go around the horn to do some introductions so why don't you kick it off chris yeah awesome thank you mike thank you for having me uh my name is chris avilas i am a teacher in the Fairhaven school district over at nowood middle school uh there i teach a social entrepreneurship program during the day uh but after school i transform into the head coach of the Fairhaven knights esports team uh, i created this esports team three years ago and we were the first middle school esports team in the country uh, and since then, I've been taking my passion for esports and all the benefits uh, and, you know, all the great ways that it transforms kids. And I've been trying to help other districts um, start esports teams as well. Awesome. Awesome. We also have Glenn Robbins a part of the discussion today. Good morning, Glenn. Hey, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this amazing discussion uh, with some amazing dynamos in the field. Uh, my name is Glenn Robbins. I am the superintendent of Brigantine City School District in Brigantine, New Jersey, just uh, north of Atlantic City. A uh, beautiful place to be this time of the year. Uh, I've been here since February. Before that, I was a uh, superintendent in Tabernacle, New Jersey for three years. And before that, principal, teacher, coach, uh, assistant principal, you name it, a uh, wide range of uh, expertise. And um, also very blessed to be part of the AASA governing board at COSIN. Empowered Superintendent Board and also NJASA's um, Technology Coach there, which helps oversee New Jersey's largest tech conference or Techspo every year. So um, just excited to be here and, and excited to be in Brigantine as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Glenn, for joining the broadcast this morning. And finally, we have Lawrence Coco, who is actually a part of the it, he definitely looks familiar because he was a part of the Sustainable Jersey Digital School announcement on the our Facebook Live broadcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, Larry, good good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me, Michael. And I'm really tickled to be on with Chris and Glenn. I mean, two folks that I consider to be uh, on the forefront of digital education in the state and nationally. 
um, both of whom are award winners, and they, they can tell us more about that later if, if we can work it in. But um, I, I was the director of educational technology for the New Jersey Department of Education for 13 years from 2004 to 2016. As part of that, I was uh, a, a proponent of game-based learning strategies for as part of our computational thinking student technology literacy standard that we established in 2015. Um, you know, I, I actually co-founded a, a, a nonprofit, Games for Ed, Games Number Four Ed, uh, years ago to help promote the use of game-based learning and education. For years, I was a member of a World of Warcraft guild called Inevitable Betrayal, with educators around the world uh, 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 slaying dragons and <laughs> doing dungeon runs uh, and finding ways to integrate game-based learning into their curriculum and their teaching strategies. And um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, brain-based uh, research and theory that supports the idea of scaffolded learning, scaffolded returns, uh, scaffolded rewards that makes uh, for the most effective learning strategies. And um, that's what game-based learning is all about. And that's one reason why it's so effective in a, in a school setting when it's done correctly. And we're gonna be talking about that with Chris and Glenn. You know, it's not, it's not just throwing a student up on a, a computer and saying, you know, go play Fortnite. It's about having a really well thought out plan about how that student is, is trained to be an ethical player, how there's support behind him, how everyone can get involved, how this, this and I'm sure Chris is gonna talk about this, how it's such a cross-curricular activity, how, how it gets everyone involved in the school, really, if you let it. And um, I, I, honestly, I could go on and on, but I don't wanna suck up all the oxygen. So I'll let, I'll let Chris go because he's, he's got some really exciting stuff to talk about. I, I am so, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, the success of what Chris is doing with uh, eSports in the state. Absolutely, Larry. Couldn't have said it better. Um, as we move on with the conversation and start to get to the discussion, um, I wanna keep welcoming into people into the chat. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Lorenzo. Good morning, Jason um, from Hamilton. Uh, good morning from Jersey City, Lorenzo, Bonnie. Um, and we'll, we'll get to some of these questions for sure that are already coming into the chat. Um, so let's dive right into the conversation here. Um, Chris, do you want to start off? I mean, what is the real value of Scholastic Esports? So for those who aren't familiar, esports is basically competitive video game playing. This, the same way that two teams will meet on a football field and battle it out head to head um, is, is what esports is all about. But what Scholastic Esports is, is this idea that kids love playing video games, right? We know 99% of boys, 94% of girls under the age of 18 report playing at least two hours of video games a week. Scholastic Esports takes all the things that we want to teach them and can teach them through games, right, um, in a way that they already are engaged in. And so esports definitely does have a competitive side and, and I'm a very competitive person. You know, I've coached here in the state for 10 years and uh, I played, you know, sports in high school um, and in college. But the other side of that is understanding that your esports team can be a gateway uh, to introduce students to social emotional learning, to introduce them to um, health and wellness, to introduce them really to um, some new friends maybe they haven't even met yet. So what Scholastic Esports is, is, is taking that competitive side of video game playing, all the values, right, that we get out of that just through the, the competition, but then also packing in other really valuable life lessons that we can use to teach our kids. Absolutely, absolutely. So why should every school have an esports team? So, um, yeah, Chris, you want to start us off? Yeah, so I, I think the benefits of having an esports team, me first and foremost, um, you know, I've wrestled my entire life, and, and I would argue that wrestling is the most inclusive, accessible, traditional sport. You know, I've coached athletes that have been deaf or blind or had some other physical handicapped. Um, you know, I've had students who have been on the spectrum. I've had students, you know, from, from all different walks of life, and they've been able to find a home on the wrestling mat. Esports, I think, is even more accessible, right, than wrestling. And what I love about esports is not only will it draw out kids who maybe can't play traditional sports, but you're going to find that it draws kids um, that maybe are underserved in your school, right? I, I, I like to say maybe they don't have a homeschool connection. So typically after school, maybe they just go home. They don't partake in sports. They don't partake in clubs, right? They may, maybe they just go home and game. The beautiful thing about bringing esports into the school is that you're going to bring a lot of these kids together that maybe don't have a home, you know, outside of, uh, you know, 
some of the other extracurriculars. Uh, and they're going to come together, form new friends group. They're going to have an affinity space where they can share their passions with other students. And for me, that first and foremost is the biggest and most important thing through eSports is that we build um, a community within our schools that really draw in kids who may need it the most. Definitely. Glenn, Larry, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I can chime in a little bit and, you know, just thinking about what just Chris just talked about with the sport, look at all the positive benefits that each sport brings to a school district. And now you're providing an outlet to all the other students that may or may not be a part of that. Um, you know, I, I look at it like a unique thing, like here we are in a brand new world um, where we can't really touch, can't really do anything. Um, and but yet in esports, they can still do some sense of normalcy. Um, and let's think about that. You know, when you combine all the major league sports teams, except for the Super Bowl, you know, eSports World Cup outshined and had more viewership than any of those combined, excluding the Super Bowl. So the kids are there and the adults are there and, and they want to play and, and so forth. But to Chris's point, it's providing an outlet and, and collaboration. You know, speaking as a father during the pandemic that we have when the school buildings were shut down, the school was still being you know taught. I saw my son connecting more than ever with his friends and his neighbors. So he had a sense of normalcy. And when I was making phone calls around the parents, uh, you know, whether it be a staff member or a, a, a parent in a district or whatever it may be, a lot of the dads that I talked to said the same thing. We never thought we'd say this, but video games are helping us in our household right now because of that connectivity that these kids are having. And, uh, you know, thinking about that as we go forward with this road back uh, program for New Jersey, especially, is how do we continue sports programs in a time that is very unique? And there are so many, you know, the world changes every 24 minutes, and let alone 24 hours. And yet, with esports, it's constant connectivity. And as long as the districts have that, and those families have that, um, there's just so much potential. Absolutely. Like yeah, I think I, I think the se the sense of community that an esports league can bring to the students and the school is of such incredible importance now. Um, when, when you look at all of the, the reports and the studies about how our, our, our students are suffering mentally and that they've lost that sense of connectivity, they, they don't feel like they belong to a community anymore. This, this is not going to take the place of face-to-face, -face, but it's a wonderful way to not only reach those students who typically aren't involved in the community at the school in person, who go home and game, as was mentioned before, but it's a way to bring everyone together so that you know you can still have that connection. It's such an important part of the mental and social emotional health of our students and, and our and our teachers and our instructors in order to keep them connected, to give them a goal, to give them a, a sense of purpose, to build a team around the effort. I, I mean, you know, you when, when you're when you're dealing with uh, an esports team in an esports league, you can um, you, you get all, all kinds of different folks involved, graphic designers from the art department. You know, you need, if you're doing a live uh, event, a, 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 a tournament, you know, you need a, what they call a caster, uh, an esports sports caster. And, you know, that could be from the journalism folks. And, you know, there's, there's a, um, mo most of the programs I've looked at from the college level on down, most of my experience until now has been at the college level has been that you know they'll establish a set of standards where it's not a right, it's a privilege for these students to be part of the team. And they have to have a certain grade point average. They have to promise that that you know they're they're gonna do a certain amount of physical exercise so they don't they don't uh, uh, atrophy in, in, in any way or suffer any uh, ill or medical effects from staring at a screen for hours on a time. There's mandated breaks. It's a wonderful way to to uh, 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 invoke and enforce and train the students in, in being part of a team and part of a community. Definitely. And I want to follow up a little bit about what Glenn said before, you know, as a, as a superintendent, Glenn, and with the challenges that come with being a superintendent, why do you think that school should have an esports team? And like you said, do you think having an esports team makes the transition back to school, whatever that looks like come September easier? Well, you know, I just like I said, thinking about it from a, a father lens, I think it's going to help my son transition easier because he's had that connectivity. It's not like he went off the grid and hasn't talked to anybody for the last four months or five months. Um, so I think that that truly helps. And I, and 
you know, right now, superintendents across the country are racing radically with their, their communities to try to figure out what's the best way and what's the best opportunity for schooling and what that's going to look like physically. We know we can do it virtually, but what's it going to look like physically? So it, that's a lot on the on the minds of superintendents right now. But like these gentlemen talked about, the SEL uh, aspect of it, knowing that they have connectivity, knowing that there can be some type of normalcy, that there can be some kind of team play, um, you know, because you look at the actual other sports that are out on the fields, you know, they're being postponed back till later months. And some are, you know, in the collegiate levels are saying they're not going to play until at least the spring. You know, and I think that's the beauty with these sports. They can play whenever, however, and put these teams together. And like Chris said, when you have a coach that's leading them and taking them through the proper uh, procedures and processes, and then to Larry's aspect, talking about all the other various avenues that come with that, um, it's just so many exponential opportunities for these kids to have in this new world. I, I just I think back to when I took my son to a Sixers game in December, there was an eSports arena set up inside the Sixers stadium, you know, and they're obviously building one right now near the Sixers stadium, but you know, exclusively by itself. But my son and I went there during half time and he got to play for a little while, but you got to see and talking to the individuals, what it took to set up, what it took to market, what it takes for a professional gamer is what they're doing, you know, you know, at home. And I know it sounds unique to some people here professional gamers, but you got to think some of these kids and some of these adults are making multi millions of dollars, you know, through sponsorships and marketing and so forth and actual gameplay. Um, but like I said, it, the connectivity allows things to transform easier instead of everybody coming back stone uh, all the way. I, I often talk to friends about this. I said, imagine if this would have happened 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, they would not have had those connectivities for the most part that they have now. Um, you know, all it takes yeah. is a simple microphone to talk to somebody. And then from there, the coach can help set up guidelines to Chris and Larry talk about more. So I, I just see so many positive benefits to that. And I know there's always like, well, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? The same thing can happen every day in any other aspect of life. It's just all about the policies and procedures that the coaches and the administrators work together for a team. Absolutely. Uh, Larry, well, you want Michael, to add? Michael, if I could. Yeah. Yeah, if I could jump in for a second, you, you could see me, right? <laughs> but but um, talking about all of the different uh, support roles, uh, this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is just exploding. I believe it's the fastest growing industry on the planet right now. I was at a conference at Lackawanna State College in Pennsylvania. They have an esports program. They give scholarships. And the presenter said that for every high level uh, esports player professionally in, 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 in the country, there are 24 support personnel behind him. That's 24 jobs, most of them high paying. It's, it's uh, the caster, it's tech support, it's marketing, it's business plans, it's graphic design, it's a physical trainer. This is an incredible career opportunity for kids to make good money in something that they love. And to build that community and that that team mentality and those capabilities while you're in middle school and high school, I mean, colleges in, in New Jersey and across the country are gearing up for this wave. Stockton University um, ha has a great program. Rowan uh, was supposed to uh, finish building this spring a million dollar esports arena in Glassboro. Uh, Rutgers University has a huge esports program. You know, so so if we're talking about preparing students for college and career. Esports is not just a game. This this is part of life right now, part of going forward. It's part of a huge worldwide growing economic enterprise that if we don't prepare our students and take advantage of that, we're not giving them the opportunities that they would otherwise have to be part of this growing field and high paying careers. A ton of great points. Um, thank you all. I mean, I wanna get to a couple of questions in the chat right now. Um, I guess I, I guess you can kind of say it's like a, an, an elephant in the room almost. Um, Terry said, so many think video games are teaching violence. Can you speak about the great values games can teach? And she also says, thank you for bringing up the arts involvement. And then to follow up on that, Jason also says, you know, she, he's a lifelong gamer and participated in collegiate esports himself. You know, nice. in his district, he had some comments on whether the district should host games that contained realistic violence, for example, Call of Duty, Rainbow Six, that type of those type of games. 
the worry were the worry was the implicit endorsement of violence. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, I've been coaching an esports team at Knollwood uh, going on three years now. Uh, but I've been involved with esports since 1998 when I used to do uh, a lot of competitive StarCraft. And, and I've been involved in the scene ever since. Um, and so I think those questions go hand in hand. There's been a ton of research about violence in video games, and, and they've found no correlation between violent video games making violent students. However, to, to the second comment, I don't think that realistic violence has a place right now in our schools. So your, your Rainbow Sieges, your Call of Duties, I don't think that's the kind of games that we should be pushing. Um, I know that high schools especially are a little bit more flexible with, um, I guess we'll call it, you know, fantasy style violence. That would be like your Overwatch, your um, Fortnite, where there's not a lot of blood and instead of actually dying, they kind of just like disappear and respawn. I personally don't have a problem with that. Um, but I can imagine some school districts do. And so that's why uh, the game that we play, and, and especially at the middle school level, the game that I promote is a game called Rocket League, um, which the easiest way to understand that is soccer with cars. But going back, if somebody really truly believes that violent video games make violent people, it's really hard to convince them, right? You can show them all the research in the world, but that's more of a, a feeling, right? That you're gonna have a hard time um, dissuading that person of. And so what I would then say is, again, those benefits, and you heard a lot about them, but let me try to categorize them. You know, I see two big um, benefits when it comes to esports in schools and, and why we should be um, encouraging students to play video games. And so the first one is that SEL piece. With my team, I tackle SEL, right, kind of in three levels. Just like traditional sports through esports, I could teach my kids teamwork, communication and leadership, right? So the same way that when you're playing football, you were wrestling, um, you learned those skills from being part of a team, you're still getting that same experience by being part of an esports team, right? That's what competition brings. Um, but I think there's a second level, right? That second level um, that I work a lot on is health and wellness. And so part of that is making kids understand that their diet, exercise and sleep have an impact on performance. And, and what I've noticed is, if you wanna to talk to kids about that kind of stuff, if you don't kind of wrap it in a way that they care about, they kind of glaze over. And so when I talk to my kids, I talk about peak performance. If we're not having a good day you know, in practice or we didn't play well in the match, you know, are you operating at peak performance? How much sleep did you get last night? What did you eat for breakfast? Oh, you didn't have breakfast. Oh, and then you had you know, a monster energy drink for lunch. How do you think that affected you? Right. Um, so, you know, working in stretching and mindfulness activities, both before a match, after a match, and even when kids get frustrated. Right. So because another big thing um, when we talk about SEL and kind of like that health and wellness aspect is dealing with right when we get frustrated in a game, um, when things aren't going our way. Right. How do we work through that? And so making that part of what esports can teach kids, just like when I coached, you know, football, wrestling and track. Kids when you know, get off the mat and throw their headgear and then you address those issues. We want to make sure, right, that kids are learning just as much playing esports as they might be during traditional sports. So a good esports program works in diet, sleep and exercise, works in, um, you know, talking about how to, uh, you know, not, we, I guess we would call it, you know, tilting or, or raging, getting angry when you play a video game, right? So, um, you know, on my team, we use kind of like a green light, yellow light, red light. Green light, you can keep playing. Yellow light, you need to maybe go take a break, take a breath, take a round off. Red, night, you or red light, you probably need to be done for the day, right? And so addressing all those issues that maybe parents have seen at home, you know, if you have a kid and he's at home screaming into the headset and getting frustrated and throwing his controller, right? Those are things that we can address through an esports team, a scholastic esports team. Um, and the other side of that, right, that third level of SEL, um, you know, is really important to me. And that's tackling digital culture, right? I think that a lot of times um, we kind of release kids on the internet and parents don't fully understand what's out there. And so sometimes games and gaming gets a bad rap just because um, there's a certain subculture, a certain set of people that are considered toxic, right? And those are the ones that may make homophobic or racist or misogynistic statements, right? By bringing esports into the school, gaming into the schools, we can model appropriate behavior for our students. You know, um, if a student were to say something like, oh, you play like a girl or that's gay, right? Having a coach in the room, we can address those issues. We can address those microaggressions and we can deprogram that, especially if we start them young. So that way we're building an inclusive 
um, diverse culture around gaming. So I think from the SEL standpoint with esports, you're getting the traditional values of teamwork, leadership, communication type of skills. You have the opportunity to teach health and wellness, right? You can teach time and place. Homework comes first, um, you know, screen time and, 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 you know, delayed gratification and knowing when's okay to play and when it's time to wrap it up. But then we can also build a inclusive culture um, around gaming that sometimes, you know, isn't all that inclusive. And on the other side of that, some of the stuff that you've heard from Larry and Glenn, but I want to address a little bit more specifically, um, a good esports program wraps up career technical education into it. So you heard Larry and Glenn talking about how um, esports can be really cross curricular within schools and the fact that it leads to a lot of um, careers after school. And so one of the things I think is super important to understand is a good esports team isn't just about the kids playing the game. You want to have kids on your team, right, that also fill roles. You know, I have 18 kids on my team that are there just to play the game, but they also have other roles. And I have some kids on my team that aren't even necessarily there to play. I have a dedicated team journalist. I have a dedicated team podcaster. The kids run the social media accounts. They do all the marketing to make the flyers. My kids fill out the forms that have to go to the superintendent to rent the space because anytime we play a match, right, all the parents come into our library um, and, and they watch us play. So there's a whole lot because, like Larry said, this is the fastest growing industry in the world. And if we're serious about getting kids in STEM jobs, this esports uh, e ecosystem, right, Larry said, has 24 jobs for every professional player. We need to be serious about esports, and what better way to give kids CTE training than letting them get hands on, right? I know that my kids, they don't want a 30 minute PowerPoint about what marketing is and, and what marketing career is. But when I tell them that we have to promote the event and they have to run the social media and they have to make the flyers and you know um, they have to send emails to the newspapers to get reporters to come and cover the event, that's hands on real experience that is transferable to high school, college and beyond. And I think the other part is making clear that um, esports can help students follow their passion for gaming all the way into the workforce. You know, my my team has a really great relationship with Rutgers. And so students that I've graduated from my middle school went to our regional high school, started an esports team there, have a great relationship with the kids at Rutgers so they know they can play esports at Rutgers and then follow their passion into a career after that. Or a lot of people don't even know that the military Right, three of the four, um, three of the five branches of the military have an esports team. So you could join the military, you could join the army, go into one of their 150, you know, one of their 150 vocations. Whether you play for the actual army esports team or recently, I joined um, the Discord, which is a communications app um, for the army, where they're hosting leagues, you know, on basis for soldiers. So when they're not at work, you know, they can go and and, and play, you know, uh, with other service men and women from you know the military maybe then to college or into a career so there's a lot of um upward mobility with esports whether it's a career that they go into or it's something that just motivates them um to choose a path after high school and i think those are two big areas um and two big benefits of esports that have nothing to do with the game right you're really bringing in a lot of kids from a lot of different uh areas of your school you're getting together in an affinity spaces they're going to form new friends groups um, and I think there's a lot of value in that that goes beyond um, just playing that game. Absolutely. And I, I want to read a comment from the chat to kind of wrap up this part of the discussion. Uh, Jason says, important career bit. It is not just playing games. There are eSport lawyers, media production, event planning, talent representation, marketing, and et cetera. And I mean, this conversation, I the list goes on. 20 what was that chris 24 other people per pro For player every professional esports player there are 24 careers um behind that person that support their ability to be a professional incredible absolutely so let's move on with the discussion a bit um how does esports work in school out of school i know you touched upon you know the 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 stuff that the kids need to do in school, promotion of the event, but what are kids doing out of school? Do they have practice? Um, do they play video games in school? What, what are the students doing? Um, so the way it works at my school and what I'm seeing, you know, with the other schools that I, I work with is um, whether it is during a lunch recess advisory period or whether it's after school, like a traditional sport, the kids are meeting up together we're coming into the room, we're turning on our computers, 
as the computers are loading up, we're talking about our goals that day for practice. We might be doing some stretching. We might be doing some breathing, getting ready. Um, and then we jump in and, you know, again, drawing on my 12 plus years of varsity coaching here in New Jersey, it's very similar to what you would have at a traditional practice. We start off by doing drills. We then move into scrimmaging. From scrimmaging, we film them, and then we might break down the film. We might analyze different areas we need to work on. Um, and then the kids are usually going home with some type of homework, you know, something that they can work on. But that homework or things that they work on at home, right? My kids sign a contract, and, and I would hope other schools do the same, right? School comes first. Um, getting your work done comes first. And if and when you have that discretionary free time, if you choose to practice to get better at the esport that you're involved in, right, here's the things that you can work on at home. And so it's really just modeling that time and place for kids to make sure that they're getting all their other done stuff first. And again, that's exactly what I did with my athletes. You know, if I had a kid who came to practice, you know, Coach Beals, I'm going to be a half hour late. I got to go to extra help for English. School comes first. Right. And like Larry even mentioned earlier, I know personally on, on my esports team, and I would encourage anybody who's thinking about an esports team, I tie behavior attendance um, and grades to my program, you know, just like I did again when I was an athlete, uh, excuse me, when I was a coach. Um, but Glenn, I mean, I guess from a superintendent's perspective, what would you what would you want to see to get a program started in a school? Well, I just want to go back to some of your comments earlier, and I, I love everything you were talking about, Chris. Um, just just thinking about the SEL, the CTE, the health and wellness, the digital culture, digital citizenship that you're talking about, and I just call it citizenship in 2020 20 anymore, um, and the empathetic piece. Imagine if we had been doing this for 20, 30 plus years. What would our society look like right now? Instead of what we look at when we turn on social media and go, oh, my goodness, here is a firestorm over the smallest or the biggest things ever. Imagine if, you know, these parents uh, were kids back then that had these opportunities, you know, and you focused on that. So I'm looking at it from that lens as an educational leader and as a father, you know, that you're teaching them and helping guide them all these corrective practices. And not only that, not only just them, but it's also the communication and the connectivity uh, the whole community and the parents. You know, I couldn't tell you the amount of times I'd have to stop my son and sit him down and talk to him about some of the things he would say or somebody was something saying to him. You know, by having that, just like everything you're talking about, it doesn't have to be esports. Take esports out and put in another word, whether it's an organization, whether it's a classroom, whatever it may be. These are the things that you're hopeful for, you know, in education to better our world, you know, as we continue going forward. Um, so, so coaches like you, Chris, and, and, you know, other people that have these conversations that are so willing to share out and help others, because a lot of times people want to start something. And the first question they ask is, do we have the money? Do we have the time? Do we have an advisor? And, and where do we even start and how do we go from there? And, and to take it a step further, Chris, I guess the question I throw back on to you is, you know, with this, you know, road back, we're not supposed to be sharing or touching anything of somebody else's. So, how do you navigate that from an esports aspect as a coach now? Yeah, I mean, um, so it's interesting. A lot of programs were able to continue their esports season uninterrupted because of the online nature. And so even if we are back face to face or hybrid or we're at home, we're still able right to have our you know our season um tools like google classroom google meet discord um to continue our community online and what i love about getting an esports team you know striking now while the iron is hot is no matter what school looks like in september or you know if we have to break because we have flare-ups or whatever you want to say um esports will continue to be uninterrupted and for a lot of kids right that was the one constant in their life is they knew that we had practice Tuesdays and Thursdays from three to five. And that was really important for them. Um, so I think that that aspect of esports, you know, we can be in a room socially distant, but still be playing as a team. Um, so I find, you know, that's really valuable. And so the, the one thing that I, I want to share from that aspect. Um, so being so passionate about esports, one thing that I did, because I get a lot of questions about how can we start an esports team in our school? How can we, you know, do this? And, and I was actually working with a school district yesterday who is taking their athletic travel budget since they're not going to be traveling and is, you know, using that money to start up an esports team. And so I've been helping them. But, you know, 
this is something I'm super passionate about. So what I did is I started um, a nonprofit called Garden State Esports, uh, along with Steve Isaacs, Regina Schaefer, and Dr. Matt Strobel. If you're not familiar, they're all New Jersey educators. So we're all in the class and we're in the school. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help for free every school in New Jersey start an esports team who wants them. Um, and so if you're listening and you want to bring esports to your school, whether you're a parent or a teacher or an administrator, go to gsesports.org. Um, we have all free resources, all pre-made pre resources you need to get onboarded at your school. Um, we provide the competition, we provide the league, um, and, and we want to make sure, Glenn, like we're, we're talking about, that it's done right. So, you know, Steve Isaacs just wrote a great post um, about how you can have a esports team in the time of COVID and what it looks like um, to have that team, you know, meeting virtually or face-to-face, -face, socially distant. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there to make sure that we do things right in New Jersey, because the other concern I have, and I won't go too deep into it, is we're the only nonprofit in New Jersey, but there are a lot of for-profit companies that are trying to monetize kids and promising everybody the world. And I think this is one of those spaces where we need to, as always, as educators, protect our students, right? Whether it's in the classroom with social distancing or making sure that they're not being monetized and marketed and sold um, by some of these for-profits. And so I think for me, you know, that's going to be the most important thing. That's how it has to be done. If you want to bring esports into New Jersey, into education, it has to be educator led, student driven, student focused, student centered, um, and then making sure that we we do it right. You know, we we put in the CTE, the SEL, we build those affinity spaces that are inclusive and diverse for students. Um, and, and that's just something I've been super passionate about. Definitely a lot of great information and I'll, I'll get that link from Chris and I'll put it in the comment section below after this broadcast. Um, as we, as we wrap up the discussion, I definitely want to get to a hot topic in the chat for sure is how do you get started? I know you wanted to share that, that landing page and that website, but if a group of students or, or teachers or parents wanted to create their own esports team in their school. What are the first couple steps that they need to take to get that off the ground and running? Um, so I think the first thing you're going to need to do is you need to get, get buy-in from your stakeholders, right? People like Glenn, so your superintendents, your principals, your board of ed. Um, I think once you've convinced them the value of an esports team, you need to find an advisor, right? A Somebody within the school or school appointed who, just like a club, can oversee the club. And it's important to know that they don't have to be gamers or knowledgeable in the game, whether it's through Garden State Esports or just a whole host of wonderful people in the esports EDU community. Um, you know, you can run a team without knowing anything about video games, right? I'm not a great, you know, Rocket League player. My kids are generally better than I am. And so my best kids become the coaches, which is a whole other side of the SEL story. Um, but then after that, you know, it's really just finding competition, working in those really valuable lessons. Um, and yeah, it's it's really not as bad as people think it can be. Great. Um, Glenn, anything to add about the steps that your district took? Well, like I said, I'm, I started in February. We don't have one. And that's obviously been one of the big things that I'd like to bring into this. Um, so, you know, to Chris's point, you know, I did look at his page that he shared out about the Garden States. And it's extensive and it's quite easy to follow through. So I'm going to, you know, talking to our director of curriculum and we've also have a connection like they mentioned earlier at Stockton University because it's right down the street so we're going to hopefully team up with them but like I mentioned earlier there are just so many positive benefits to this in our new world that we are now even before COVID um, and to Chris's point and Larry's point there are just so many opportunities that can come out of this and that's ultimately what we want as an educational leader is to provide opportunities for kids to go on to bigger and better things than any of us could ever imagine so us giving those gateways and those opportunities, uh, anything's possible. Definitely. Uh, Larry, anything Anything else, final thoughts? Well, just real quickly, I mean, if there's any trepidation or hesitation about forming a, an eSports team, you know, start small, do a pilot program. And um, if you do it right, the success will drive you going forward. Um, and, and just one last thought I wanted to throw out there. What got me involved in game-based learning and esports, I don't know, maybe 2012, 2013, is I, I started reading a book by Dr. John Seeley Brown called The New Culture of Learning. And 
And uh, he was talking about how, you know, game-based learning is so effective in modern education. And then I watched a, a webinar by him and he said that he would rather hire a high level World of Warcraft gamer uh, than a Harvard graduate. And he said that, that people just don't realize the incredible amount of data and information and quick reflexes and quick decision-making skills that a high level gamer develops in a game like World of Warcraft and other games that makes them especially, especially suitable for being competitive in a digital economic environment. So that, that's a, that really got me thinking, and that's what drove me to start integrating game-based learning theory and practice. I mean, the research is there, folks, it, it works. And if, if you think games are just for gaming, they're not, it's, it's big business now. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I think that you know, we all owe it to our students to be on the forefront of what careers are available and what education and brain-based learning theory shows us. And, and you know, esports and gaming is a, a very viable solution in terms of reaching students in a very effective way. Absolutely. And as we wrap up the broadcast, I want to throw it back to Chris. Any final thoughts, any resources out there to, to wrap up the broadcast? Um, yeah, I would just direct anybody interested to check out GardenStateEsports.org. We have a lot of the resources up there for free. Um, you can reach out to me at T-E-C-H-E-D, up teacher, teched up teacher on all social media. I'll talk about this all day. I'm happy to help you, your district, um, bring esports to New Jersey. Um, and, I, and I hope to, you know, we have 580 something districts in New Jersey. I'd love for every school to have an esports team. Absolutely. And I'll paste all of those, uh, all of the things that Chris was, was talking about, his email and everything else in the, in the comment section below. So you can reach out to him and his social media. So I just want to thank Chris, Glenn, and Larry for joining us today on the broadcast. Incredible discussion. Um, I want to thank all the live viewers for joining us today. Um, we are about 150 likes away from 4,500 here on Facebook and only 50 followers away from 5,000 on Twitter. Absolutely incredible. We are so proud of our community that we're growing here on these Facebook live sessions. So if you like what you saw here today, give this video a like, leave it a comment below or share this post. It really helps our broadcast grow and get the content out there to the community. I want to let everyone else know that you know, future Facebook Live events will be announced on NGSBA.org through School Board Notes and through our Facebook page. So like I said, you're already here. If you haven't already, click that like button. For the latest information, bookmark www.njsba.org backslash COVID-19. And I'll put that in the comment section below as well. That is our incredible resource page, everything COVID-19. Um, and now we've transformed it to the road back so that landing page is updated daily it's a real joint effort across uh, the association so again thank you all for joining us today and i hope everyone has a great rest of your thursday have a great weekend and stay safe awesome thank you so much stay safe everyone